Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Before I introduce today's guest, I just wanted to say a big thank you to those of you that have uh, subbed, liked, or engaged in some way with the channel. It's really appreciated, and it does help the channel grow. If you're liking the content uh, that we've produced so far and you want more of the same, or you want um, some slight differences, please do like, comment, and subscribe. And uh, go ahead and hit the notifications button as well, which will let you know when the next uh, videos are coming up. So let me introduce today's guest, Daman Sony. Uh, he is the chief business officer at Global Bees, an aggregator of digital brands that transforms marketplace sellers into international brands. Daman leads business growth for portfolio brands. He has over two decades of experience leading growth and marketing for marquee brands. Till recently, Daman was leading growth at Boat, where he launched new brands and scaled up the D2C business by 15 times. Earlier, he was the CMO and growth head at Mobiquick and Milk Basket. He was also the India head for Line. Uh, his um, degree is from NIT Rockella, and he is a, an MBA from ISB. Daman has driven growth of multiple products to 50 plus million users in record time. He has also served as a growth advisor to several startups, including White Hat Junior and Snapchat. Daman, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, man. Glad to be here. <laughs> a lot of people, were, when they uh, when they get introduced, they feel, oh, that sounds pretty amazing, doesn't it? <laughs> and it really does. It really does. And um, like I was just saying to you before we began recording, um, the real purpose of this podcast is to try and um, liberate some of the secrets, so as to speak, of people's careers and uh, the things that they found important and the insights that they've developed along the way. And part of that is understanding the path that has led them to entrepreneurship in the first place. So in most of these cases, it's always good to go back to some relevant part of the early part of the career and just understand how you began, what your aspirations were at that time and how it's developed from that. Yeah, sure, sure. So, um... Uh, thank you for having me on the podcast, man. So uh, this goes back in uh, 2009. I was based out of London and I decided to become an entrepreneur uh, uh, and wanted to get into the ed tech sector in India. And uh, long story short, my first startup bombed really bad. And uh, there was a huge amount of learning for me there. You know, uh, it was something which, uh, you know, I just thought about with a couple of friends and uh, we dove right into it. Uh, but you know, you, you know what it is, right? Uh, when you're far away, the missing pieces are impossible to see. And the deeper you get into an industry, the more obvious the missing pieces become. And uh, when we got into this whole business, we realized we've got the sales cycle entirely wrong. We've got the buying behavior of the consumer wrong. Uh, and it took us a while to figure that whole thing out. And well, what was that business, balance. incidentally? So we were building a uh, school ERP systems, uh, okay. and we had positioned them, positioned it as uh, parent engagement software. And this was very early days. The iPhone had just launched at that point in time, so there wasn't a very rich mobile interface, right? It was uh, the, the parents could log onto the computer at home and see what kind of marks the kids have got, what kind of activities they are in, how they're doing. It was more of a parent portal kind of a positioning. But then we realize when you go to send to schools, it's a yearly buying cycle, right? They're going to start a software only at the start of a session. They're not going to introduce a software mid-session. And then there was a lot of pushback from teachers wanting to use tech to do stuff like that. And this is 2009. I mean, right now, everyone's got a phone in their hand. Everyone's quite conversant with digital. Uh, and uh, other than that, the way the schools are structured in India, we kind of realized that, you know, uh, it's not the principal who's the main decision maker, but the school promoter. And anything that raises the school fees is what does well. Uh, not so much the other value propositions. So yeah. very good learnings for us initially. Uh, and this was also the first time that I actually started working in India. Uh, I never worked in India before. I always handled international clients. So I don't know what got into me saying that, you know, I can 
not only work in India, but I can also sell to an Indian consumer. So it was really? a trial so, by fire. So you, you hadn't worked in India before, like before ISB, for instance, you were always off-site, on-site. Right? Yeah, so I, yes, so I was with Infosys, but my client was always abroad, right? So I was yeah. uh, either, if I was in India, I was working for a client abroad, working, I mean, interacting with my uh, counterparts uh, in different countries, or I used to be on-site, uh, you know, on the client location. Uh, so, yeah, interactive with an Indian consumer, an Indian buyer was something which I had never done before. Mm, interesting. So, uh, but I think uh, in hindsight, nothing could have uh, built me better than to have that first startup, yeah. right? Because that actually got me learning really fast, right? Uh, but like one of the cultural things for me when I came to Delhi, and I never stayed in Delhi also before my life, was people don't say no. Uh, it's it's a hard yes or a yes kind of a thing, but it's a never a no. So you got to know when a yes is a no. So <laughs> that 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 got me, you know. Uh, so stuff like that is something which I learned uh, over a period of time, and uh, from there and started my journey uh, in this whole uh, entrepreneur uh, arena. And I think now it's been around fourteen years. Uh, worked with multiple startups. Uh, started a few of my own and uh, yeah uh, the ride's been good well i mean it, it, it's interesting that you mentioned because quite a few people have also said the same thing that they're beginning i mean okay they were employed right at the start learn a few skills yeah. built up networks and all of that kind of thing but some of the early uh, business ventures were you know they kind of failed now, how long did you give that first one of yours before you decided to pull the plug on it? So I gave it around two years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, before we uh, decided to you know, sell it to another company. Uh, and, oh, right. Uh, so it was in a saleable position, in which case it wasn't really uh, you know, a failure. It wasn't a sale, sale so it was more like a saving face kind of a sale. Okay. Right. Uh, uh, you had some I intellectual wanted... property and so on. Yeah, so I wanted the the software was delivering value, right? It had it. Uh, it was deployed in yeah. It's gone gone by So we did. Yeah, I can hear you again. Yeah. So uh, the the software was still running uh, in uh, hundred schools. So uh, we just didn't want to shut it down. Uh, so in, uh, instead, we merged it with another company who then took the software forward. Okay, got it. And were you um, were you revenue positive at that time then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we were generating revenue. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we did a fair amount of revenue uh, in that business. Uh, uh, another mistake that we did, did is we didn't raise funds early. Okay. Uh, right. We kind of thought that uh, you know we can generate enough revenue and then grow. So those are the kind of learnings that we had to rapidly imbibe saying that, you know, if you have to grow fast, you do need a certain amount of capital uh, and investment rather than, you know, uh, letting the the revenue, uh, you know, grow it pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, understood. So you became a, a, a quite a believer in obviously the this ecosystem that you eventually became a part of in the value of um, external capital for driving growth. Well, uh, yeah, uh, I wouldn't say external capital. Yeah, so let me, let me rephrase that, right? I understood the value of capital, whether the cap whether that money was generated from a customer payment or if it meant raising capital from a VC or from angels, right? I, I understood that what role capital plays in the early days, right? There's a lot of, uh, when you're starting out, uh, a lot of investments are, are front loaded, right? And you cannot wait for revenue to start pouring in to make those investments. You need to have a certain amount of capital which you put in, in your own, or you raise it, right? Uh, uh, to uh, diversify your risk. So yeah, uh, that's something that uh, we took away. But more importantly, what we took away is the understanding of what a sales cycle is, how much time it takes to close a deal, uh, what the cash flow cycles are, because uh, we understood the value of payment terms, whether it's 15 days, 40 days, or 90 days, and how it makes or breaks a company. So that's something which, you know, uh, 
I learned to watch very closely uh, as the years went by. Yeah. So you you were uh, keeping a, a, a kind of keen eye on the order to cash elapsed duration. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's that's something of a, that discipline got built on really early on and in a hard way. Yes. Yes. But did you did you bootstrap the early part where you were actually developing the product? Yeah. Yeah. We bootstrapped our way, man. Uh, uh, since uh, both the founders, we were all from the IT background. Yeah, uh, we kind of understood what it takes uh, to build a complex system like that. So uh, uh, we bootstrapped our way to building the whole system. But uh, when it kind of came to selling, that's when we realized that uh, selling to school is a very feet on street uh, kind of a problem. You can only sell uh, at that radius in which the salesperson can roam around. Right, so uh, uh, the fact that we did not hire enough sales folk right right early on is what impacted us because our rate of closure of schools was pretty long. And like I said, you know, uh, you sell the whole year, but you have to deploy only at the start of the session because in the middle of the session, no one's going to change their entire school processes. So that's so you had one shot of deploying a software in the twelve months. So that's where we 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 felt that you know. Uh, the whole year, we need to be selling really hard to be able to, you know, uh, take stuff live, uh, live in those two to three months. And what was your approach to sales? I mean, did, how did you did you do it yourselves, or did you sort of um, use an agency or something to, uh, you know, get the word out? Yeah, I fundamentally still believe that every entrepreneur should be able to make the first few sales on their own to understand. Uh, the mind of the consumer, what goes on, what, uh, how the consumer perceives risk while buying from you and how they perceive value while buying from you, right? So uh, the first few sales were definitely done by, uh, by the founders. Uh, but later on, we hired a sales team uh, 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 in multiple cities. And yeah, uh, we went about that. Mm. So was there um, much you know, in the way of like reg regulation required in, in systems such as that? Not so much. This this uh, business wasn't so much uh, impacted by regulation for the service provider, uh, but the way the regulation allows the school set up to be in India, that uh, impacted the way the, the buyer would purchase the software. Right, schools in India have to be set up as a non-profit. So there's usually a trust, and the trust is funded by a, a, a holdco, right, uh, which extracts all the value uh, after paying the school uh, costs. So yeah, it's the holdco owner who takes the decisions typically for any ca uh, capex investments, not the trust, which is run by the school principal, so to say. And and was your system, uh, you know, in a kind of um mini sap type thing or or did w was it a you know a software as a service business model subscription model no so we we created a software uh, as a service model we didn't want it to go as a deployment model uh so it was a per student per month pricing method i think that pricing was pretty awesome uh at that point in time it was one of the early companies who went uh into doing that uh so that was just to reduce the decision making time for the stakeholders, you know, saying, okay, this doesn't cost much and I you know, can get on with it. Mm. Uh, because CapEx investments have a lot of to and fro uh, initially. And also, this was something which wasn't done before uh, for schools uh, uh, in India. So, we wanted to make the decision, we wanted the decision making to be as seamless as possible. Mm. So, all right, you obviously you, you mentioned that, that that particular one didn't go uh, the way you may have wanted it to. However, there were uh, a, a lot of uh, learnings for, for you. Um, what what came next? How did you rebuild from that, if you like, once you had sold that product and that company? Oh well, after that is when I actually got into the into the, the digital side of things, right? Uh, um, I uh, went into a startup uh, as a co-founder, wherein I learned the whole ad tech space, right? Uh, grew that company up. Uh, understood digital marketing, uh, 
was one of the forefront companies in India who would run marketing for market brands. Uh, in fact, Howard's, Howard Business School's entire digital spend used to be handled by our company. Uh, 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 Which company was company. that then? This was PK Online. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, once I exited that company, I ended up joining Line as an India head. Because, I remember uh, that, yeah. Yeah, when uh, a Line came to India, they wanted a rapid growth uh, and because I had built a foundation of digital marketing at that point in time, got a, got a very good idea of how to grow brands uh, in the digital realm, right? So uh, we launched eight odd apps in India, uh, uh, drove it to millions of users. Uh, but the interesting thing there was, uh, again, uh, you know, if you see, a, you see that arc of, technology uh, uh, adoption, India at that point in time was just getting onto 3G, right? It wasn't very 3G compliant. And Line was an app which was developed in Japan, which was really at an advanced 3G stage. So the, the app could crack in a 2G environment, right? Uh, because it, the like we send GIFs and we send uh, emojis and stickers, right? These are, these are, uh, as compared to text, they, they consume a bit more bandwidth, right? So uh, uh, the chat would be a bit slow. And that's when WhatsApp came into India, right? And WhatsApp was pretty basic at that end point, just, just text, right? No images, nothing. And uh, that's when the adoption of WhatsApp started increasing and Line started uh, facing a, a bit of a problem over here. And, uh, you know, if I... If, but the, the, the product was fairly more advanced than what a WhatsApp was. But as things stand, you know, uh, the, the story has been written about WhatsApp in India multiple times, right? They kept the product simple. It was fit for a 2G environment. And as the speeds in India grew, so did WhatsApp also evolve. So the timing for WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp's evolution coincided very well with what India's technology enhancement was. Uh, Line was fairly advanced with respect to the bandwidth uh, that India provided that, at that point in time. Uh, so yeah, Line I ran for uh, almost two years. We launched multiple apps. We launched multiple gaming apps. We launched uh, a, a music app. We did, a, we did an acquisition. <laughs> uh, we did tons of stuff. Uh, we did JVs in India. So, so that was a pretty awesome ride. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, post post line, uh, uh, had a few entrepreneurial stints. Uh, did a lot of growth marketing for companies in fintech, in uh, e-commerce, and uh, 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 again fintech. Yeah, so uh, then got a got a fair good idea of what what goes on in growing different businesses in India, right? And uh, that's, that's for me, you know, as a person with a growth mindset, I just don't seek a challenge, I thrive in it, right? If there's a new business wanting to grow, grow in India, you know, I, I, uh, I kind of get quite kicked about it and, you know, figure out how can we do this? Because what I did for Line six years ago, if I use the same techniques today to grow an app like that, it won't work, right? So you have to do something very, very dramatically, very dramatically different. And that's, that's, that's what, uh, you know, uh, got me going. So, yeah, I think a lot of the stuff that I've done in the past uh, eight or nine years have kind of culminated in what, where I am today and what I'm trying to do today, right? In yeah. terms of yeah. growing multiple companies uh, simultaneously in the e-commerce uh, realm, uh, uh, you know, uh, of India. And I think that's, that's, uh, something which is pretty exciting for me uh, at this point in time. So, I mean, obviously growth, marketing, those have been major parts of your career roles, certainly since uh, uh, ISB. But were you, were you in that marketing area before ISB as well? Or were you, you know, kind of tech and product focused at that time? Oh, yeah, I, 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 I was a quarterback. ISB. Like, uh, I, I went to ISB to 
you know, move over to the marketing side of things, yes. understand what the marketing frameworks are. So ISB was quite transformational for me uh, in terms of uh, my thought frameworks, uh, in terms of how to break down uh, a business problem. So uh, it definitely helped me evolve, uh, you know, pretty quickly and set me up for the next next stage of my life mm. and transform from being a techie to a business person. So what, what would you say are the, the kind of uh, common things? Obviously, you mentioned that there were differences and some of those are technologically different um, between how you would grow um, a product business, say, 10 years ago versus now. But are there some common themes as well in the marketing approach? So the first principles remain the same, man. Uh, always understand what a customer wants, uh, understand where your customer is and reach out to your customer and articulate the value. So yeah. those first principles uh, remain pretty uh, same. What changes over time is the channels, for example, right? When Line came to India, it wanted to uh, get, uh, you know, 100,000 users in the first month. Uh, we ended up getting them a million users in the first month. Wow. Using just plain old Google advertising. Now, if I try to do that, it's become expensive, right? To use the same channel because everyone's on that channel, the bids are pretty high, right? How do I go about that today is going to be very different than how I did it uh, uh, at that point in time. But it's again, the first principles again remain the same, right? I want to find out where my users are hanging out. I add a great value, from, uh, uh, value to them over there and, uh, you know, try to get them onto the platform, right? So uh, th those are the first principles that, that we, we uh, typically work on. Second is, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what your lifetime value of a customer is, right? And what your customer acquisition cost is, right? These two variables play a very key role in how you want to go about this, right? Uh, if uh, your customer lifetime value is, let's say, a couple of hundred thousand rupees, uh, I don't mind going on Google and doing the same stuff and getting a million users right uh, uh because you know i'll be net positive but it's if it's going to be a few hundred rupees then it is it just doesn't make sense eh, to go uh, uh on that plain jane route and plus what happens is uh digital is not one medium right it's a platform so uh a new channel comes up uh tiktok didn't exist five years ago, Insta didn't exist eight years ago. So uh, you, as a marketer, you need to keep understanding where the user is. Like today, a lot of kids are on Discord. I'll probably market on Discord if I want to uh, get up with you, right? I probably will not go on Facebook. No, uh, you know, uh, the teenagers are not there anymore uh, 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 on Facebook. Uh, but if I want to go to 40 plus males living in a tier one or tier two city, probably I'll market to them. On, I'll still market to them on uh, uh, on Facebook. So yeah, th that that keeps on changing. And for a marketer to understand this needs to have the ear on the ground, right? Understand yeah. what the the uh, trends are, what the usage shifts are, right? Uh, what kind of emotional value uh, that a user is getting out of a particular channel, right? Uh, so those are something th some of the things that we really uh, track uh, pretty closely. So are you uh, at Global Bees, is it essentially a, a angel funding or, or like a VC, a full VC? I don't know. So, uh, you know, we have a completely different animal. So uh, the way we operate is uh, we take a, a, a majority stake in an e-commerce firm, which we believe uh, we can grow faster. Uh, quite often what happens, so e-commerce is not as simple as it seems to be, right? Wherein you manufacture a product and you sell it, right? And every founder is pretty good at some of the things, right? You have to first understand how to produce the product. Second, you have to uh, understand how to distribute it uh, using let's say marketplaces or your own website and each one of them, each marketplace behaves differently, right? Specifically for India, let me tell you that there are, we work with 20 plus marketplaces in India, right? So 
how do you manage your inventories across all these marketplaces? How do you manage returns? How do you manage customer experience, listings, advertising, marketing on all of these marketplaces? So it's, it's quite complex. So what Global Beast does as a company is it, uh, while it invests in the company, it, it brings this whole ecosystem and you know, we've developed a whole lot of tech and platforms around this uh, to you know, uh, enhance the growth of the company. And uh, that's the value that we, uh, that we bring in. So it's not a pure investment uh, company, so to say. Okay. Uh, we also we are we are also, we are very hardcore into operations. We are a very boring company. We 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 put our heads down and get into operations. You know, <laughs> eight to twelve hours a day. That's what we do. So, w- w- what are the types of um, portfolio companies that you have? I mean, do you focus in uh, a kind of specific e-commerce segments like fashion, say, or you know, whatever, or or, or digital products or how is it? So uh, we are into a number of categories. Uh, home and kitchen uh, okay. uh, is one of the big categories that we are working in. We are also acquired uh, uh, or partnered with companies in sports and fitness, uh, beauty and personal care, consumables. So it's it's quite a wide array of uh, uh, sectors that we are in when it comes to uh, uh, working uh, yeah, in these. Uh, uh, working on the uh, e-commerce side of things. Uh, what we fundamentally believe is that uh, if there's a company uh, which lends itself to uh, uh, you know, uh, increasing the number of SKUs that we can sell to a consumer or uh, it has a very strong product market fit already, that's the time when we come in and you know, really uh, accelerate things. So, what what do you um, kind of look for in this in the in the companies that you're looking to partner with? So, we fundamentally look at a founder who understands the category really well, right? Uh, and is built a, or he or she has built a company wherein there is a strong customer pull, right? Uh, and uh, with these two things in place, I think we can then you know, help address the challenges that a founder may face in production, new product development, uh, marketing operations, uh, um, advertising, brand building. So those are the areas that we come in and then add value. So, I mean, typically what what stage, how long has one of these organizations been running for? They're still in the kind of startup mode, but getting into the growth phase. Is that, would that be right? Oh, so- these these companies have been in existence for uh, a couple of years at least. Uh, yeah. they've, they've they've sold to hundreds of thousands of users uh, their products, right? So uh, there's a lot of reviews about these products online. So we understand uh, how customers uh, perceive the product, what's what kind of perception, what quality and service is there. Uh, so it's only after that that we come in, uh, you know, uh, to take it to the next level. Uh, we don't look at uh, incubating startups, remember that, right? Uh, freshly minted companies now. So we, we we look for a product market fit and then we take it from there. So the companies have already got uh, traction. They're yeah. probably, you know, they're already pulling revenue, um, but this is to drive that serious growth spurt. Yeah. Okay. That's right. And it, is there a kind of... Um, a global bees way of doing things. So for instance, in your portfolio companies, you'll see certain commonalities in the way this growth is driven. So again, first principles, right? Uh, when we are selling on a marketplace, uh, the customer, the, the product needs to be discoverable, right? So uh, is the marketplace search driven? That means does the user come and put in a keyword and then searches, if that's the case, is our product there on top? Or if it's a merge driven a marketplace wherein a user discovers your product through browsing, are we present in the right pages, right? Uh, so, so we need to figure all that out. Then in terms of uh, the brand recall, right? uh, is there adequate brand recall on that platform for this particular set of users uh, for this product? Uh, how do we solve for that? How do we solve for inventory? How do we solve uh, for uh, delivery times, 
right? Today, if a product is going to reach you in seven days, you kind of lost the customer already, right? So uh, we work very closely with uh, all the founders to also see how we can, uh, you know, put the inventory all around the country. So we invested a lot in infrastructure also, mm. right, to be able to execute this. So it's it's quite a complex operation that we run, not only in terms of uh, marketing, but also in terms of warehousing and logistics. Yeah, yeah, operations. Um, this wasn't uh, one of the ones uh, that I had on that uh, on the kind of list of questions, but I am interested in this. I mean, you being formerly a, a tech guy uh, and then into marketing and, you know, focusing on um, companies, I suppose, broadly in the tech space. What do you think about all of this AI stuff and everyone banging on about chat GPT and the fact that apps can be coded, you know, by AI and stuff? How is that going to change things? See, for a marketer, there is, I mean, if I look at generative AI, there's a ton of stuff that's there for a marketer already, right? Uh, in fact, we use a lot of them uh, in terms of uh, uh, creating ad copies, right? Doing A-B testing for ad copies, uh, uh, creating uh, uh, ad banners, uh, uh, creating even videos. So we, we use a ton of this stuff uh, uh, already because at scale, uh, uh, you can't show people at the problem. It, 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 it becomes unwieldy. Right, so yeah, there couldn't yeah. have been a better, better time for all these tools to have come in, and I mean, we've been using them. Uh, I mean, they've come into the forefront only now, right? But I mean, we've been using them uh, for ever since we started, uh, and that helps build leverage for us in trying to, you know, grow multiple uh, products. I mean, we run thousands of uh, 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 products uh, in our ecosystem. So imagine writing a copy to market each one of them. Imagine writing a listing text for each one of them. Uh, so we, we, we use generative AI to a large extent. And uh, I think uh, uh, these are early days and there's a, there's a long way to go and there's gonna be a ton of stuff that's gonna be uh, built uh, using AI. And the interesting paradox is uh, when AI conversations used to happen, I think five years ago, folks used to say that the mundane stuff is going to be done by AI. And what's happening right now is the creative stuff is being done by AI, right? So uh, that's something which someone did not see, which folks did not see coming that that fast, right? Uh, so it, it's well, you're, you're talking about things like digital art and, and um, uh, creative copy and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we always thought that that's going to be done by humans, right? But uh, I mean, still, there's a, still a lot of human element in it. But what AI does, it builds leverage in your day, right? It can do 60-70% of the weight lift, uh, of the heavy lifting, and then a human can come in and, you know, uh, tailor it, tweak it, uh, and, uh, and start its work, of, uh, work from there. So, yeah. So, so would you, your assessment be that AI is just going to be just another tool that expands the productivity essentially in the same way that say for instance you know uh, before just you know before cars came along it was horse and carriage and that had a geographical proximity issue you could travel further to work once the cars came along and so on is it that type of thing i think it's more of an email kind of thing. uh remember when email came in the kind of productivity it increased because you could have uh, asynchronous communications with your colleagues across the world uh, throughout the day, right? And that really increased us multi-threading our work, uh, you know, through the day. Uh, I think AI is going to help us do that uh, uh, going forward. So I would give it that paradigm, right? Won't be a horse and carriage kind of a thing, but more of an email kind of a paradigm. Mm -hmm. So in your assessment, looking at um, what made companies successful in the past and what will make companies successful in the future what would you say are the um the key elements that an e-commerce company has to have its eye on uh, to have a long-term future oh it's 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 again you know first principle going back to the basics yeah yeah so uh first of all make a great product uh if the product is great uh make the offer uh 
uh, great. If the offer is great, nail the customer experience. Uh, if the product offer and customer experience is great, make the creative and content great. You know, so uh, it's it's just first principle. You know, start from the product uh, and just go customer first on, on each of your decisions. I think that's that's what uh, helps an e-commerce uh, 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 company grow. And for us at e-commerce, you know, uh, uh, we while we draw out year-long plans, we, we 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 dream in years. We we, we practically we plan in months. It's not even for any. We plan in months. We evaluate in weeks, and most importantly, we ship daily. Right? We have to ship daily, and you know, so those, those those are the principles that we work on. And you know, uh, uh, hopefully, I mean, uh, we stay we stay true to this, and uh, I, I I don't see us you know waving our path. So, what's next for for Dam and Sony? What's what's next for me? So, see, uh, uh, right now uh, I'm in a space where you know it, it it checks off a lot of boxes, which has you know. Uh, caused me to blow to blow up my identity every few years. You know, it's, it was quite cathartic. Uh, uh, so here, uh, I get to work with new companies on a daily basis. I get to work on products across the range. One day I'm selling uh, uh, treadmills. The other day I'm I'm focusing on peanut butters. Uh, <laughs> the, the third day I'm, I'm I'm trying to sell door handles. So uh, for for me, it's it's quite fulfilling uh it's it's new problems uh uh every day and more importantly uh the joy i'm getting out of this whole thing is building awesome teams mm. right uh i mean uh i i, I love building teams i uh, and, uh you know i i've tell everyone you know when when i come to an organization it's not me it's it's my team right and uh i think that's that's something what's uh really really keeping me uh, uh really keeping me alive and uh, uh uh a team team is only as strong as its weakest link so for me to be able to work with everyone and elevate others i think that's really keeping me going on a daily basis so yeah it's 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 these, these things man working on multiple products working with teams so uh, uh i'm pretty happy you know doing what i'm doing right now so as a bit of guidance for people who are sort of um, beginning to architect uh, their careers and maybe they are um, their uh, employees at the moment, quite possibly with large companies or maybe not, um, but have some eye on um, entrepreneurship and starting something themselves at some point. What would be your kind of nuggets of advice to... Uh, uh, that type of person about the kind of skills they should develop and the mindset they should adopt um, before taking the plunge. Uh, so, uh, you know, assessing risk, I think it's, one, it's a key uh, skill which people need to hold, right? Understand the 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 weight of risk. Uh, figure out how you can uh, diversify, share risk, minimize risk, right? Uh, I think that's that's pretty important, and I think every day we ask ourselves what can cause us to fail, you know, and then how can we, you know, build around that. I think that's that's uh, uh, pretty important. Uh, the, the 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 second thing is understanding because you wear so many hats as an entrepreneur on a daily basis, you know, uh, every you need to take a lot of decisions, right? Uh, you're probably taking over a hundred decisions a day, and you know being exposed to over 100 situations daily, right? Uh, be it finance, HR, uh, sales, marketing, uh, you know, uh, something as simple as office getting charged, so on and so forth. So every every situation, I believe, is a function of uh, incentives uh, that, you know, the different stakeholders have, uh, personalities, uh, perspectives, and more importantly, constraints and resources, right? So uh, as an entrepreneur, you know, uh, you need to understand what are, which one of them is, is misaligned, right? What's not causing this person to do the job that he's doing, right? Uh, so how can you solve that 
uh, is it a constraint issue is it a resource issue is it an incentive issue or a perspective issue so as an entrepreneur you need to constantly be working with your team to be able to solve that figure out what is causing the misalignment own in on that and solve it and i think trust your team to you know uh, uh, take the company uh, further there's only so much that a person can do uh, in the day so it's very important to be able to delegate and also measure success right uh, but again it's it's all about situations and you know how you uh, work with people on that so certainly micromanagement is something to be uh, avoided by the sounds of things uh so well there's uh, a place for it so uh, uh i don't like the work micromanagement at all right uh, uh you can you, you micromanage your own work right uh, which i call attention to detail right if we do if you do not have attention to detail of your own work and if you don't uh, uh hire a team which has attention to detail i think uh uh the trust equation gets broken and that's when micromanaging the team ever comes in right and i think before that comes in uh it's very important to clearly spell out what is required as an output right uh and sometimes uh there are team members who are struggling with understanding what you actually want out of them i think at that point in time you need to work closely with uh with a uh, uh with a team member so micromanagement is like a broad brush over which we using which we paint a lot of stuff in a negative way uh but uh uh i mean for what we perceive it to be yes it's not the right thing but a lot of time uh a, a leader needs to get uh in on uh, a particular problem with his team member for whatever reason right uh and if a team member requires help yeah you need to you know uh, roll up your sleeves and get on to it but if you think that the team member can execute it peacefully back off let them do it let them grow into the role i i fundamentally believe that giving a person a problem bigger than himself will help him grow yeah uh, and and i i've learned this from my colleagues also Uh, you know uh, uh i would initially you know keep giving bite sized problems so that a person goes into a role but over a period of time i've realized that you give a person a problem bit big enough it challenges them to grow into that particular role so i think that's that's something which when i've learned over a period of time uh you know uh, so it's it's a journey man i mean everyone's got a different path to it so would you say that it, it's better to get comfortable being slightly uncomfortable with the challenge ahead of you in the sense that if you're feeling very comfortable in addressing it the challenge may not be strong enough i fundamentally believe that your next project should be so big that it should put your previous projects to shame yeah right and i think that's what uh, and that's the kind of people i want to work with also right who want to do something really bigger than themselves right and uh so even while hiring i i, I fundamentally look at uh, three things right uh, uh, i look at so integrity is non negotiable right uh, the second thing i look at is uh, you know uh, uh intelligence and focusing on solutions right uh, we face problems every day right you got a crib master saying that this is not working and that's not working and that things are going to go anyway so focusing on solutions very difficult very very important and the third is being a positive source of energy right and that's something which my marketing background says right because as a marketer you fail every day right uh, you you do a, you you learn marketing through a series of experiments so if you go to let that the small failures get to you i mean uh, it's going to bring down the whole team and consequently the company so you need to constantly be a positive source of energy in the team to be able to you know move things forward so uh, you know these are things that i typically look at uh, in a team member because the pace at which we are growing we will make mistakes right and we will grow because of our mistakes not in spite of our mistakes <laughs> right because yeah. it becomes very important to know what not to do uh, yeah. as important as it is to know what what needs to be done yeah 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 so uh, w- would you say then that mentorship plays a very important role in in that uh yeah yeah so uh uh mentorship is one way yeah and i and i and i believe uh uh a lot of folks today 
uh, they're looking for mentors and there are and uh, fortunately unfortunately there are good mentors and bad mentors also in the mm. uh, you know I, I fundamentally believe that a, 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 a great mentor will just show you what doors are there right rather than tell you what to do right it, a great mentor will teach you how to think about a problem rather than tell you a solution right and a great mentor will also tell you uh, you know what are the different ways in which you need to think so that you can uh, internally be happy about things right and not be stressed uh, because a lot of folks don't associate mentorship with happiness and i think uh, it's it's having a great mentor uh, mentor also has uh, uh, the role of a mentor is also to be a good uh, psychological uh, uh, you know sponge or uh, you know enhancer uh, 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 for you uh, so uh, having a great mentor is a game changer for folks and you know if someone finds a great mentor latch on to that person you know uh, let that person into your life and give give some of your time to being better i think that's 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 pretty important pretty important mm. brilliant oh i think um there's been uh, quite a bit in this and and we kind of come to the end of our time i want to say a very very big uh, thank you for for joining the podcast and uh, it's quite fascinating hearing all the stuff that you did you know since isb and how your career developed and the kind of challenges that you took on um where where can people hear more from you um uh, so i'm on linkedin yeah. uh, i'm quite i'm quite active over there um i write my own blog uh, i write a newsletter these days so uh, folks keep sending me a lot of stuff uh, to cover over there so yeah. earlier i used to write about growth now i write about uh, uh, t2c and e-commerce uh, so we write, we write a newsletter called t2c pulse so uh, uh, feel free to reach me reach out to me over there uh, i love solving problems around growth so if someone wants you know uh, to bounce off some ideas i'm i'm happy to do that i do that a lot of the weekends so yeah uh, uh, that's the way to reach out to me man brilliant brilliant all right well daman once again thank you so much for coming on the podcast and best wishes for for uh, for global bees and your portfolio companies thanks man thanks joe thanks for having me here thanks very much mm-hmm.